Greeting friends and welcome to Christian Connection, rather Christian Connection special edition. It's a two hour special. We're glad you can join us because we're gonna have lots of material to cover in the next two hours. I'm Ganem Hanna, next to me, Sheila Hodgkins. Next to her, Dr. David Taylor. And next to him, Dr. Uh, 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 Yami Bazan, who is our guest speaker for the day. Uh, and the only reason I hesitated, because I didn't know whether I should call you pastor or doctor, you carry all these credentials. So uh, thank you for joining us. We know that was a great, great sacrifice from your family time to be here with us and your busy schedule. And of course, last but not least, Gigi Novell, Dr. Novell, sitting across from us on another stage, all by herself, planning <laughs> to tell you how you can partner to help this ministry to continue sharing the word of God into the world. We have lots ahead of us. Uh, uh, Dr. Bazan, uh, we'll, uh, you can take center stage. Uh, I'll have a few words with my colleagues and then we'll pitch it back to you. So it's go, it is go time? It is go time. Let's do this. Watch your steps, please. I will. Uh, Sheila, while she's approaching the podium, we have a number of mu musical numbers today. Uh, who are the two artists that we have today? Well, I'm really excited for our, our first two segments. We have Angel Walensky, and who's going to be singing and in the first two segments. And then the latter two segments, we're going to have Asia. And her last name is Booker, Bookle. Yeah, Asia Bookle. So excited to hear them. Wonderful music. And it just, it's, I, God is so amazing how he correlates the music with the message. It always does by the work of the Holy Spirit. And right. uh, Dr. Brazon will be presenting four part segments about the Samaritan woman by the, at the well. So now she will be presenting her first segment. And then following that, she'll join us again for a conversation. Dr. Bazan, it's all yours. Thank you. I don't know what time you're listening to this, whether it's evening or morning, but I am going to tell you that what I do know is that if you lean into this story, I do believe that the Holy Spirit has a message for each of us. And I don't just say that plainly. I say that because this is one of my favorite stories. Um, for those of you that are uh, biblically inclined and know all about the Bible, you know this story is found in the book of John. And what I thought I would do at the very beginning is share with you a little bit about this story, about John, and then kind of set it up for us as we begin. So if you've got your Bibles, and hopefully you have them, because I'd love for you to follow me, but if you don't, just know I'm going to be reading verse by verse. I am that kind of preacher where I rely solely on the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to sort of speak it into your life, and I believe that's what he does. So the book of John, the last gospel to be written, one of my favorite gospels because first it's the last one, and so John, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, doesn't go into the details segment. He, he's going to now tell stories that haven't been told and he's speaking to a church that's a little bit older and it's more diverse. And so he's got to tell these stories in ways in which he could allow and bring in people from different cultures and from different ways of life and that they could actually hear and know this Jesus. I love John also because John, as a disciple of Jesus, was actually a disciple of Jesus. And I always say this about the gospel because it's important that we know the the beautiful thing about the gospel is that each writer is writing from their lens, their point of view. Well, John followed Jesus. John and Matthew are both followers of Jesus. And so he's writing this story. Now, John is also a master storyteller. John is telling this story and John chapter 3 at the same time. They, there's a theme that carries between two stories. Let me point this out for you. For those of you that know these stories, you know chapter 3 contains the story of my panel on this side. Do you know who chapter 3 the story is? Who is it? It's, it's Nicodemus, right? Chapter 3 contains the story of Nicodemus. 
He is a high standing ruler. As a matter of fact, he's a Sadducee who's one of the highest rulers of Israel. Chapter 4 contains the story of the Samaritan women. She is a woman. She's Samaritan, which means she's from the lowest of the lowest. His audience leans in. Chapter 3, he comes to Jesus. Do you remember when he comes to Jesus? At night. In chapter 4, she's going to come to Jesus in the middle of the day. The theme of chapter 3 is found in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. The theme of chapter 4 is now visually seeing what it looks like when God loves the world. This is John. John does this throughout his gospel. The stories go together. The stories tell and speak of a larger theme. It's why I call him the master storyteller. So chapter 3 and chapter 4 are connected, but I am going to be reading to you from chapter 4. And the chapter 4 begins with this. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and he went back one more to get once more to Galilee. When I first encountered this story, I, I almost ran by so quickly this verse that I missed something incredibly important for somebody like me. I am a third, fourth generation Adventist. I have been in the church and in the faith for many years. The faith had to become my own faith. It has been my journey of faith. I often talk about it. It was my grandparents' faith and my parents' faith, and I had to figure out how it could become my faith. I say all this because when I began the reading and I realized the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing, right? There is now a sort of conflict that begins, right? They begin to compare notes. The Pharisees, right? The body of Christ, the people of God are starting to compare notes or they're getting threatened by what's happening, even though it's not even Jesus. And the first thing I will ask you is, what does the Bible say that Jesus does? Does he enter in full force and try to explain himself? Is that what the Bible says? What does the Bible says? He says, when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Tonight, I hope to share with you different principles in each section. And this section is called to me, a word of caution. We as the body of Christ can sometimes get ourselves lost, comparing notes with each other, fighting over who has more membership, fighting over who has who, and in the process, who exits? Jesus exits. The Holy Spirit now awakens Jesus and moves him to the next location. I don't know about you, but in my own life, I have said to Jesus, I beg you, do not let this happen in my life. When I say I'm a follower of Jesus, I don't want to be known as somebody who in the midst of the fighting, Jesus exits and has to go look for somewhere else where his word will be received. So I've got a son and a niece, born two days apart. So we call them the twins. When they were little, I remember my sister loved going to like uh, model homes, you know, the homes that they're about to sell and they're fully furnished. She loves looking at the different, uh, like the way they decorate. She, she's really creative that way. And so I remember they were little, they were probably about four or five or so. We, we went on a Sunday just to go model homes and the kids would go and they'd get to run all over the house and kind of see it while she looked at the details and said, I love this, I love that. I remember one day we were downstairs in the kitchen of the home when we hear upstairs there's a fight going on. So we make ourselves up the stairs, go all the way, and we find that Danny and Ashley are inside the master room closet fighting. And it sounds something like this. 
I got here first. No, I got here first. This is my playhouse. No, this is my playhouse. And they're in, in there just battling against each other. And here comes my sister and I, and we're looking at them and we're like, Danny, Ashley, you're inside a closet. This is a closet. This is not even our home. Go pick a different room. Choose. There's like five, six bedrooms in this house. I remember that evening when I was sitting alone with God. I began to think about what I had witnessed with the kids. And God impressing me on my heart, Yami, this is, this is what happens when you miss the point. This is exactly what you can do if you don't realize that everything about your life is making sure that Jesus has a place at the table. We will sit and waste our time battling, fighting over details. And here it was a closet. It wasn't even theirs. Friends, the first word of caution as we enter into the Samaritan story is allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life and say to you, hey, what are those places, Spirit of God? What are those places in my life that instead of inviting you to stay, help me make it better? There are places where we argue and we fight, and in the process, you exit. For we don't want Jesus to exit. I want Jesus to be at the center of every moment in my life. Amen? Wow. Amen. Come back and join us. Uh, wow. <laughs> Dr. Taylor, what are your thoughts? Well, as I listen to it, my heart just burns within me mm. just to see it's all about Jesus. He is the one. And we'll find this in the Gospel of John very vividly. <laughs> Good practical theology yeah. that we find there in John. And so just, and the kids fighting in the closet, mm -hmm. oh, we want Jesus in the heart. There's room right there. It's so important, you see. And so I just appreciate your approach and I'm looking forward to the others. Oh, good, oh, good. There's lots more. It, it gets better, but this is just a word of caution. Yeah, you know? it sets the stage when um, they say that the Pharisees heard that um, Jesus was baptizing more than John was. So, you know, it's kind of like, hmm, are they, uh, you know, what, what, what is he preaching that John's not, you know, mm -hmm. so. And that's often how we set it up, right? When the reality of the gospel is that all be saved. So whether it's John or Jesus, whoever is doing the baptizing, we need to be celebrating for their getting to know the kingdom of God. For the, for, the, for the Pharisees, it would be they're being converted back into the kingdom of God, right? Because that's what it would, they would have interpreted mm. as. Yeah, but you see, they were in the human nature still. They're quantifying, right. not looking at the quality of conversion and transformation. And just like when you mentioned Samaritan woman was like here. Imagine 2,000 years ago, socially, where women stood in society. They probably were completely silenced right. mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were stoned on the streets if they were accused of anything. Mm -hmm. And here's Jesus. They just demonstrate God's love and sweetness toward humanity. That he doesn't care what people are going to say. He came with a perfect mission, with pure heart, knowing this woman's going to be there. If he knew all about her, then he knew she was going to be there. And he made sure that he was going to be there to approach her and talk to her. Uh, which, which I think it's really beautiful. Uh, and I happened to see a picture uh, just not too long, long ago as we were working, Daryl and I, on selecting the images for tonight. And we came across a picture where Jesus approaching a modern woman dressed in, in, in 2022 next to the well. Mm. And it is, that picture spoke at me so much that that's the same Jesus from 2,000 years ago. He's interested in every woman, man, child mm -hmm. today as he was back then. Right. And he's interested in all of us, one by one, 
to bring us into his kingdom. And, and what's I'm so, going to go there. So you all just kind of wait. We will you're, wait. You're getting ahead of, uh, <laughs> ahead of it. Stay at the introduction. Thank you. Stay at the introduction, friends. <laughs> I'm going there. I'm going there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking all about this. Uh, but staying at the introduction with your, your comment about the women, this is something that John, as a gospel writer, does really well. We were talking about that. Yes. Uh, John brings in stories, and he's careful to bring stories of different women that were not mentioned. Like, you can see he's very, he's very intentional mm. about that. Yes, yes, he is. And Jesus comes, they're baptizing more than John. Mm -hmm. And John is six months older than he. Mm. You see, they're relatives. And uh, this young fella, people, Jesus didn't do the baptizing. He had those whom he had chosen to do it, you see. And he's now baptizing more than I. I won't call it sibling rivalry, but here we find change taking place. And John was very filled with the Holy Spirit in that he says he must increase. That's right. John the Baptist, yes. right? Yes. I, I must decrease. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist, you see. And, uh, and it's really interesting, humility, how God can use us. And we see this. This is why the Gospel of John, when they will put the little books in trailway mm. bus station, Greyhound bus station, the book that most people loved the most and took was the Gospel of John. I did not know that. The Gospel of John. And uh, I think it draws more pictures in the narrative of the <laughs> book of John, it, it kind of paints it for you. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what most people can relate, mm -hmm. why they can relate to, to, to that book. Uh, but wasn't it true that the disciples did most of the baptism and not Jesus himself? Yes. So that comparison by them was kind of inaccurate also. Yes, and, and John, he would come into the city, observe people, and it helps us today in mm -hmm. our approaching people in the community. John will come in and Observe. That's in a book called Desire of Ages. Mm. Talks about how he came into the city, observed the people. Then when John would speak, oh, they would listen. He was different, you see. And so uh, I just love reading about John and Jesus working together for how you tied it in so beautifully. Mm. The baptisms that follow and what's so important about them. And I'm looking for the rest of the story. Yeah, there's more. Yeah. Do you know, it's back again to how the strategies Jesus did. He seems he picked his target throughout the Bible, you know, who he wanted to speak to. And then he presented his case and then he declared himself, right. which is kind of interesting. He always did have a strategy. Right. Uh, he didn't just kind of just pick people randomly. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was consistent in his way of approach to others. Well, what I would say that what we call the strategy, he would say it's the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Amen. so Jesus was very aware and would move with the Holy Spirit from place to place, right? Because he was very much about, and John writes, uh, writes on this, Jesus was very much about doing his Father's will, right? This is, and so he recognizes what he's here for, what he's going to do. We'll remember in the, in the Gospel of Mark, right, the beginning of Mark, when uh, Jesus is at Peter's house, remember, and he's healing people, and then Jesus says, I have to go away, so he goes away in the evening, and the next morning, Peter and the disciples are like, let's go, we've got people waiting for you, and Jesus says, wait, wait, we're going to move to the next town, right? He was very aware, I, I call it in modern day terms, of moving with the spirit, of knowing I'm not going to get stuck in what humanity, what man, what I, I've come to do the will of the Father. And what is the will of the Father? Well, it's that all be saved. And so I am walking, and for Jesus, it was death, really. The will for him, his role was going to be to come and to surrender fully. But that required that every day he surrendered differently. Correct. Well said. Uh, let's stop right here so we don't run ahead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think we are ready for, not, for music, our first music. Who do we have? Yes, we um, have Angel Walensky, and she's going to be singing um, Fill My Cup, Lord. Mm. I was seeking 
were things that could not satisfy and then I heard my Savior speaking draw from my well that never shall run dry fill my cup Lord I lift it in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things of gold but none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ my Lord fill my cup Lord Thank you so much, Angel. What a beautiful, timeless song in which that message never ends. And I have to say, I have to inject in here that Angel is my student, my nutrition dietetic student, so I'm so proud of her. So LLBN family, we don't have to wait for Thanksgiving to give thanks. Yeah, we don't have to wait for that for Thursday to come. You know what I'm thankful for? I am so thankful to God for all of our volunteers here who show up to LLBN week after week after week for years. Just when I look across the stage and I see Ganem, Sheila, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Bazan, and ZIA, who's actually leaving us, but we're, we're grateful for him. And I see Evie here at week after week they're here more than I am. It's so amazing that they give so much of their time. I am grateful for them. It is because of them that our ministry keeps going on. So what about if you give a thanks offering today to LLBN in honor of our volunteers? Send in your donation. You could mail it to, you could write a check and mail it to LLBN. P.O. Box 550, Loma Linda, California, 92350. Or you can go directly to our website at llbn.tv and you can give directly there. And then you can also call. Our operators can take your donations there at 866-552-6881. And in the Bible, it says, in Psalm 50, 23, it says, He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. So your gifts of love that you are sacrificing, giving to LLBN so we can continue our ministry, you are actually showing God how much you love him. 
you know, some of us are not able to come here, I understand, week after week, or you live in a different state or in a completely different place, but it's okay because you could still show your love for LLBN and support by sending in your gift of love, your donation, which we absolutely appreciate from the bottom of our hearts. So thank you, LLBN family, in advance. Hi, I'm Wesley To. I'm one of the volunteers of LLBN. And I want to share with you today a simple but meaningful encounter I had with a friend recently. He called me on the phone and said, Hey, Wesley, thank you for sharing the needs of LLBN in terms of uh, getting new equipments so that we can have better quality programs to uplift uh, the souls, the heart of people to the throne of God and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And he said, if you had not shared that on LBN, uh, I would not have thought about it. See, this friend of mine, he has been setting aside his blessings to share with broadcasting ministries around the world, and now he wants to share that with LBN as well. And LBN's blessing is not only that, but it's also how we touch the lives of many people with us that has watched LBN and, and worship with LBN uh, congregation. A retired pastor who is not coming to church anymore because of the difficulty of movement uh, told me that he enjoys the Sabbath worship on LBN because it comes straight into his room through his TV and he can continue to worship with the people of God. And this is the blessing that LBN is bringing to God's people as LBN uplifts the love of God and the name of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. And we thank Dr. To for his commitment to our LLBN Chinese channel. As a matter of fact, through his involvement, uh, Daryl and myself uh, just recently were able to bring in 200 more programs for the Chinese channel that will begin airing here this winter. Uh, very exciting news. God seems to continue nurture this ministry through so many good spirits and through so many who are willing to support this ministry, whether through programs, giving, prayers, or volunteering. So we thank the Lord for that attention that he's given to this ministry. And speaking of volunteers, I do want to recognize Dr. Gigi Novell, a busy woman like the rest of our uh, co host here. Uh, but she does live up to her commitment on a regular basis and always, always here to support us when we ask. So thank you, Dr. Novell, for your commitment and love toward this ministry as well. Well, uh, we have still lots ahead of us. Three more segments, more music, and more discussions. Uh, what is your next topic? Well, I continue this story. What's my next topic? Um, the title I have here from you. Yes. If you want to stay with that, it is He Comes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. My favorite section. All right. Are you ready to share that with yes. us? Yes. Always ready. Please take the pulpit. Uh, meanwhile, again, we want to thank you folks, as our uh, prayer partners and our financial supporters for helping LLBN 27 years staying on the air broadcasting worldwide. And now we turn it over back to... Dr. Bazan. Thank you. So if you're just joining us, you're going to have to catch up and go back and read, but hopefully you've stayed with us. We are in John chapter 4, and uh, I am now in verse 4. We have introduced Jesus, the main character of chapter 4, and we've introduced, I think that's pretty much the main character. Here we go. Verse 4 in chapter 4. Now, he had, got, he had to go through, he leaves to go to Galilee, right? He had to go through Samaria. So he comes to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. 
And let me pause for a second. I'm going to keep reading, but I just want to pause for a second. It says here he had to go through Samaria. Now, technically, Samaria was the shortest route, but none of the rabbis would have ever gone through Samaria. None of the Jews would have gone through Samaria. Samaritans and Jews had a feud. You can read about it in 2 Kings 17. It had to do with when, you remember, the northern kingdom gets attacked by Babylon, and so then they take the people, they take them to Babylon. Then Babylonians, what they would do is, is they would go back and they would send their people to these small towns. They would take their brightest minds. You remember the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach. They would take their brightest minds and then they would grab their own and they would send them back so they could populate and they could take over the towns, right? So this is what has happened. 70 years later, you could read it in Ezra and Nehemiah, they return now back and they find that these people are now what they would call half-breeds. They have intermarried, they have lost their faith. And so the Jews and the Samaritans now begin a feud that lasts for generations. We, most of us don't have that kind of racial tension as they would have. Jesus, listen to me, Jesus goes to Samaria. He leaves the Pharisees who are battling over who's, who's doing more work And the Bible says he goes to Samaria to Jacob's well. Jesus in a split second is going to bridge the Old Testament with the New Testament. And in that second, he's going to look ahead. And we get to see what the future looks like. The Bible story continues in verse 7. When a Samaritan, it's the sixth hour, okay, it's noon. The Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman says to him, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And John says, because just in case his readers don't know this reality, because remember, John is writing to Jews and Gentiles and to the new converts of the church. He says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I want to set the scene for you. It is noon. If you know anything about the Middle East or you know anything about these cultures, the women would come to the well. They would come early in the morning because during noon, it's it's hot. They're carrying these big jars of water. She's coming to the well. She actually has a well in her town. She's actually walked outside of her town, is in the middle of the day, walking over to Jacob's well by herself. This well activity is a communal activity. This was the time where you get to talk to each other and share stories and find out what's happening. She's by herself, it's the middle of the day, and she's coming outside of her town to a well. So when you imagine her walking to that well, I want you to imagine her with her heart heavy, and she is in a deep sigh. She's on her own, it's hot, and there's something more here to this story. She looks ahead to the well, and she realizes, oh, there's somebody at the well. And by the way that Jesus was dressed, she would know instantly it's a Jew. Jesus hasn't said he's a Jew. She knows by the way he's dressed, by the way he looks. And so just imagine her heart dropping. And she's starting to kind of protect herself because she knows she's about to get hit, like just either verbally or because this is not an encounter that you find. But she's meeting Jesus. She's meeting Jesus. She doesn't know it yet, but she's about to meet the king of the universe. She doesn't know it yet. But she's about to meet the rabbi that's going to transform her little region. The story says, who speaks to who first? 
It is Jesus. Who comes to the well first? It is Jesus. Friends, if there is something about the gospel and about God that I love is the fact that we worship and we serve a God who always comes first. This encounter is planned by him. This encounter is an encounter that has to happen. We're going to find out in Acts why it has to happen. This is going to be the, one of the largest converts, evangelistic converts for the Acts community. Jesus always comes first. From Genesis to Revelation, we serve a God, we worship a God that from the beginning made it a point to say, I will come first. He comes and he creates. We sin. He comes and creates a reconciliation. We mess that up. He comes and calls a nation. He calls prophets. He calls now Jesus. We serve a God who comes first. If you're ever ashamed of the gospel or ashamed of, like, religion, I need you to remember the simple fact. The God that you serve came first. He always does. It is what made him different from all the other gods. He wasn't a god in Israel. He wasn't the god who was satisfied with being up in heaven by himself while his beloved children were here. No, no. He says, I'm going to come and I'm going to dwell with you. I'm going to be, be, pitch a tent next to you. That was completely unknown. That was, nobody had that kind of god. Usually you're afraid of the gods. Usually you're worried about what the gods say. But friends, our story is a story about a God and a son of God who have said to us from our beginning, I will come first. I will speak first. I will call you first. If you're sitting listening to this, and this is the first time you hear this, I need you to, to know that you're not hearing my words that it is the Spirit letting you know it isn't by chance. But he has planned and ordained this meeting. The second part of the story that I love is that she is at awe and she says to him, how is it that you're speaking to me? How, how are you talking to me? Do you not know you're a Jew? I'm a Samaritan. But friends, we serve a God who says to us, I am not looking at your outside appearance. What does it say to Samuel? When Samuel's trying to choose a king and Samuel's trying to choose the tallest, the best looking, Jesus says, God says to him, I don't look at the outer appearance, right? This is what man does. Man creates judgments and caste systems and statuses, and they create all these things that separate it. I, God, I look at your heart and you're ready. You're ready. And so he speaks to her, and in speaking to her, he acknowledges her presence. And then he asks her for something. Now, isn't it that just like Jesus? Always giving us an opportunity to enter with him to the story. This is Jesus. He doesn't need to ask her for anything. If he wanted water, he can ask the angels to produce water. He could himself snap his fingers and get water. But he invites her, and he asks her for her help. It is what he does with you and me every single day. He invites us to co-labor with him. Not because he can't do it, but because he knows when we enter with him in this work, we will be transformed alongside of him. He comes first. He's not bound by the outer appearance. And he invites you. You've got something that you can contribute. Why don't you join me? I am thirsty. Can you give me some water? Amen. Amen. Another outstanding segment of Beth, the Samaritan woman by the well or at the well. Um, thank you for that message and for illustrating Christ, mm -hmm. gentleness, love, willingness. He asked for a cup of water and in return what he offers her, mm -hmm. a fountain. 
of water, life, the abundance of life. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't ask much from us. Mm -mm. He wants that personal relationship, that cup, cup of my attention, a cup of my uh, repentance, a cup of my humility. In return, he embraces, he loves us, he gives us. Uh, it's really beautiful. Dr. Taylor. It's, it's more than beautiful as you listened and you painted a graphic picture. Mm. It had all the details there, like mm. a Picasso, you might mm. say. But we'll notice Jesus went there purposely. Mm. It was providential, not accidental. Mm -hmm. And that woman came at high noon. And as you pointed out, the, the good people went in the morning, the good people went in the evening, people with bad reputations went at high noon to perhaps burn the evil out of them, you know. And, uh, and Jesus began to talk with her. And what's so phenomenal, as you look at the background, if you were my wife, I would not talk to you publicly That's right. That's right. in that culture. You didn't do it. And here he's talking to a woman at noon, didn't know her, and then he asked her for water. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. it's interesting. She's a Samaritan. Yep. And as you look at backgrounds on the Samaritans, mm -hmm. you pointed it out so clearly how the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians, the ones they kept like Shadrach, Meshach, mm -hmm. and Abednego, they were bright teenagers. Mm -hmm and how they began to intermarry. They mm -hmm. called them half-breeds. Half-breeds. They were half-breeds. That's right. And this lady is a half-breed. You don't talk to ladies publicly, and you're asking her for a cup of water. What they touch is unclean. Mm -hmm. What they drink from is unclean, and you want water from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus was unusual. Yeah. Practical right. theology, right. loving people, irrespective. Yeah of their culture. Breaking all the rules for all the good reasons. Right. Sheila. Right. Yeah, uh, just, he just showed value just right from the get-go because um, no one talked to Samaritans, especially if you're Jewish. <laughs> and so it, it always surprises me too that she, she gets so transformed just in that, those few moments. Um, and just for God just talking to her, it's like, you know I'm Samaritan, right? You know. Yeah, like, you uh, must be not from around yeah, here. You know, she's exactly. probably like, you're, what? You're, you're, where are you from? You yeah. Know. There's, and, a, uh, there's a passage in, the, in Isaiah 61, 3, without going through the whole passage, but I give them beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. If you listen to that and see what Jesus did, mm -hmm. he's taken from nothing and given everything to humanity. That's where God love is. And Jesus came in, obviously, to demonstrate God's kingdom mm -hmm. on earth. And he, he, and he presented it to the least of all, mm -hmm. which is so humbling right. and, and speaks so loudly of his character. Right. No discrimination against anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. And remember, John is telling both of these stories, right? So in chapter three, John is careful to have already addressed the Jewish audience Mm. the highest leaders, right? right? Because Jesus makes time for, for, for that right. conversation, right? right? And so John is now showing Jesus also makes time, right? Because John is trying to help them understand that he's not bound right. by these cultural lenses that we're often bound by, right? right? right. And so here she is, you know, here, here she comes and John now tells her story alongside his right. story. You know. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so uh, we're getting ready for another musical number. Uh, what do we yes. have next? We get to hear from Angel one more, one more time, and she's going to be singing about the goodness of God, just like the woman of the well who witnessed that. Mm. For your mercy never fails me All my days 
I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend Oh, I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. My life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Cause all my life you have been faithful. You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Amen. Oh, Angel, I just love that song. I love the message of that song because God is always so good to every single one of us. Thank you. So I'm going to ask my friends over here, each one of you, do you like to shop in person or online? I'm going to start with Gannon. Both. Yes. Both. Okay. Yes. Sheila? Both. <laughs> All righty. Dr. Taylor? Definitely 
In person. <laughs> in person. Okay. And Dr. Bazan? Both. Both. Yes. Okay. I know. There are definitely pros and cons of both, right? So it's fun to do both. But I must say, I love to go on Amazon. And if you have a Smile Amazon account, you could do what I am doing. Every time I make a purchase on Amazon, I have connected my account so that it always makes a donation to LLBN. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a good reason to shop online. Of course, not everything, but some of your things. So think about those different ways that you can give back. And, you know, isn't it just incredible that it has been 27 years that LLBN has been able to serve the Lord. And they have been doing it on their own. LLBN is an independent ministry and nobody else out there except for you, our LLBN family, is supporting us. And we really are so grateful for each one of you because it's your gifts of love that keeps us going. So there are different ways that you can give. You could write a check because many of us are still writing checks and then you can do that and you can actually send it to LLBN PO Box 550, Loma Linda, California, 92350. And if you're like me, I'll say, yes, I'll give, but then I kind of forget to. Then you know what the easiest way is to go right now to your computer or to your phone and go to LLBN.tv and you can give your gift of love right then and there. But if your memory is so much better than mine that you will remember to give later on, then definitely sending it the other way is fine. Or please call our operators. They are waiting for you. And please call 1-866-552-6881. And they are ready to take on your, your gifts of love. Now, if you don't have any funds to give right now, you know, there are always times that you could take on a personal project. Here's an example of what I did when I was little. I got my neighbors who were younger with me to sell things with me. So you know those banana wafers back in the 70s and 80s? I don't know, they probably still have them. I wrapped every single one of them and I got the rest of my neighbors to give 25 cents to every single little wafer that we sold. But that was my investment offering when I was little. And so maybe you can come up with a way that you can raise funds personally, not just this time of year, but throughout the year so that we can continually support and give LLBN our love through our offerings and definitely our prayers. We absolutely appreciate your prayers that helps keep us going. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Evie, and as an active Christian, I was inspired to become a volunteer with Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Through the years of helping to produce Christ-centered programs, I wanted to keep that connection as a volunteer, knowing these programs were going all around the world to viewers like you. I want to thank you for watching Loma Linda Broadcasting Network and making it your Christian program. Thank you. Wow, so many great testimonies. Mm -hmm. It's overwhelming. And, and, and to Gigi's point, uh, I noticed from our last year's shopping through Amazon Smile, we produced $2,100 in commissions that we didn't pay, but Amazon take a percentage of our purchase, uh, doesn't come out of our pockets from the purchase they sold us, and they allocate to LLBN. LLBN registered with Amazon Smile as a nonprofit corporation, and you can easily find it. Ask your grandchild, uh, your son, your daughter, the new generation knows it all, and they can help you set up uh, LLBN as your recipient for commissions uh, when you do a transaction with Amazon Smile. Thank you so much, uh, Gigi, for not only selecting LLBN, 
Lo Monda Broadcasting in your selection, but for also uh, sharing with us this, this, this reminder yes. for our viewers to learn. And, and uh, you know, we're so excited. Uh, uh, we all honor God in so many ways, and, and, and through LOBN is one way to honor a living God through one of his ministries here that goes into the world, lifting his name as a living God into every household that can receive LLBN. And speaking of honoring a living God, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vizan, her next topic is think again. Are we still on track? We're on track. We're well, on track. Eagerly to hear your, you. your, your message. And watch your steps again, please. Uh, how exciting when, the, when God's family come together. That's right. Amazing things does happen in his name. Dr. Bizon. Well, thank you. Again, if you just joined us, please catch up. There's lots that we have kind of gone through, but if you've been with us, let me continue on our story. We ended on verse 9 of John chapter 4, the Gospel of John, the New Testament, chapter 4. We started with verse 1, are now... Uh, I'm going to skip a couple of verses just because of time, but in verse 10, we, Jesus enters into this conversation with the Samaritan women, and I love it. He's, he's inviting her. He's asking her for water. You know, she's asking, how are you asking me for water? Now, he's engaging her in deep theological conversation because he's saying, hey, if you actually want water, like I'm the living water, he's telling her things that she... She technically can't fully grasp, but I love that about Jesus. Have you ever felt that way when you enter the scriptures, that God is trying to tell you something, but it's so big and so large, and you're just barely scratching the th surface? I do. Every time that I sit in the morning alone with God, I am aware of the grandness of what he's trying to say, but I can only grasp little pieces at a time. This is what's happening in verses 10 and 11. And Jesus reveals and he says, everyone who drinks this water. Now I titled this section, Think Again. And actually that's a book currently, but originally this was some of the work of Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman, who is a behavioral uh, psychologist, and he was an economist. And what Daniel Kahneman, he was being interviewed, and he studied the mind, and he studied the brain, and his interviewer is asking him, okay, you've spent all this time studying how we think, right? How we develop our thinking. He says, yes. And so they said to him, okay, well, how do we change a mind? And he says, you don't change a mind, you teach it to think again. And when you teach it to think again, new neurons and new pathways are being developed and you begin to reinforce those. That's you thinking again. Well, in the next few minutes, I'm going to invite you to think again about this section of this story. I'm reading from John chapter 4, verses 15. The woman says to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't go thirsty, and I have to keep coming back. I love this about this, about her. She's just staying engaged with him. Verse 16. He tells her, Go and call your husband and come back. And she says, verse 17, I, I have no husband. She replied, Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. Verse 18, the fact is that you have had five husbands, and the man that now you have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. If you're like me, you have heard this story and her story in many a sermons pointing out her sin. I want you to know that our Jewish brothers and sisters who understand the cultural context of what happened, has, they have, in all their commentaries, they have sort of like, they've been so puzzled. How have we missed the point of the story? If you know anything about her culture, none of her husbands are her choice. 
In that culture and in that time, she has no voice. She has no choice. You know this. You read the story of Tamar. What ends up happening is as soon as she is ready, maybe 14, 15, her father gives her to a man. The man maybe dies, maybe decides he doesn't want her, whatever the case may be, she goes to another, and she goes to another, and she goes to another. And currently, the man that she is with doesn't want to even honor her by making her his wife and says, that's fine, I'll offer you shelter, you can live with me, sleep with me, but you will not be called my wife. Do you understand that when she walks up to the well, what you are seeing, what you are sensing is a woman who is living in deep cultural shame, which is not hers. It is the culture in which she lives. It is the way in which she is seen. And you know this because if this was a sin story, Jesus would have said to her, go back and sin no more. He does this. But this is a different story. What if this is a, this is a story about this? Jesus has been in an encounter with her. He's been sitting with her, revealing himself to her. And maybe in her mind, she began to think, he must not know me. He must not know who I am. And Jesus enters that thought and he says to her, I know you. I know all of you. And I came first and I remain speaking to you. Friends, I have met in my life so many individuals that we, we as a body of Christ, have maybe relegated, have maybe accused, have maybe shamed them into a sin moment, not knowing their full story. Child abuse, foster, left and in that process, we begin to create ways in which we can reject them, unlike Jesus, who finds ways in which he can enter into conversations with them and redeem them from the shame and then give them something to do. This is a different kind of story. This is a story about a Jesus, about an encounter, about a God who loves us and who knows all of us. See, this is what I think happens oftentimes. We, we create masks in which we hide between ourselves and God, right? Masks because we maybe think he doesn't know what we're thinking. He doesn't really know who we are. And so we actually create, put all these masks on and the people around us buy the masks and then we begin to believe the mask, but inside we are broken and hurting and ashamed. And tonight, if you're one of those people, I need you to know that with Jesus, you don't have to wear a mask. He comes first. He engages her first. He knows all of her story. He knows her background. And likewise, he knows you. He knows your heart. And his desire, like his desire for her and for you and for me, is very simple. I want you to meet my father. I need you to see and be part of my kingdom. I need you to know and understand how much I have loved you. I need you to know this. Jesus pauses this conversation. And he says to her, I know you. Friends, when you enter into a relationship with Jesus, don't bother. Don't bother creating fists of like hiding and, and masks to so somehow make sure. Open yourself up fully to Jesus. If there's somebody that knows all of me, it is my God, my, my Redeemer, Jesus. And allow him to lift those burdens off of you. If you know this story, you know she's going to return. And you know she's going to return with a very simple testimony. I found somebody who knows me. That's all she could give. 
All she could do was run back to town and just say, I found somebody who knows me, knows all of me. He must be a prophet. She has no clue. She's talking to the king of the universe, the son of God himself, who was here in creation and will be here in the end. She doesn't. She just knows he saw me, he knows me, and he loves me. What would our church look like if every single one of us decided that our role as followers of Jesus would be to pe be people who are so transparently real with our God and with our maker that we would allow him to change our hearts, to transform our being? How free would you live if you had to, like now, if you could stop wearing masks, stop pretending to be something you're not. I will tell you that when I entered into this reality with this relationship with Jesus years ago, sure, I grew up in the church, but I had learned how to put on the masks. I had learned how to do all these things. And then Jesus called me, and I had my own well experience where he said to me, Yami, I know you, I know all of you, and I want to call you. Come follow me, come tell my story. And slowly I spent a year deep in the word with God, deep in prayer with God, and slowly he began to change my heart, to remove pieces, to remove masks, so that I too could enter into this relationship with the Jesus who was at the well, and I could actually drink the water that would change me. The invitation really in this moment is for you to think again. Sure, think again about this story. But more importantly, think again about the relationship that you have with your creator and with your redeemer and with your guide. And if there are any pieces in that story that you're trying to hide, that you're trying to seclude, tonight when you're alone, open your arms, open your heart and say to him, you can have all of me. All of me is yours. Come in, Holy Spirit, and make your home inside of me. Amen. Amen. Shining Christ beauty continues here in part three. How exciting. Sheila, what are your thoughts? That's just so beautiful. It truly is that uh, God sees her and, and, and shows her that she's loved, that she's just, just so valuable to, to him and that no matter what has transpired in her life that she that the world thinks her society thinks is just despicable that she has to go through the hottest time of the day um, where no one goes that he reaches out and says I, I would love a water from you I would love I would love you to serve me you know shows value, the king of the universe. And so she, and it's, it's interesting how just she's so transformed. She wants to tell everybody, you know, so maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, yeah, but yeah. that's, it's just uh, once you realize you have that connection that God, you, you see the goodness of God in that song, mm -hmm. that um, you've taken me from here to here to show my value of how much you love me transforms you. Yeah. So, beautifully said. Yes, what fascinates me is that John in the beginning was yes. with, became flesh and showed us how to live. Yes. And then he talks to Nicodemus, everyday language. Nick, <laughs> you need to be born again. Uh, what do you mean? I'm a rabbi. I, do you? <laughs> and then mm -hmm. something happens to Nicodemus. Chapter three, and then the next chapter four, woman, well, I'm an undiscriminatory giver of gifts. I can use women mm -hmm. 
is not confined just to men. And she tried to be theological with him, mm -hmm. but he talks with her. She talks about Jacob's well. Oh, I'm a Samaritan. We only accept Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, the history and chronicles. You Jews, no way. I'm a Samaritan. But she was changed. Parochial laws were broken. And so often, we are silent when it comes to parochial laws that discriminate against women, culture, and people. Thank God for removing the mask. It's so vitally important. And uh, it means much. What happened? Many, the whole town, great evangelists, because she had that encounter Amen. with Jesus. Well, he kind of said the, the example for people to follow. Um, we as Christians, we can live up to Christ's example. He walked to the woman at the well. Christ through us can walk to a person at a car garage fixing a car, at a teacher teaching in school, at a neighbor who's maybe working in the front yard. We can, we're all empowered by the Spirit of God to reflect that love that Jesus presented and to witness him in a loving way to offer all those people. It doesn't matter what line of work you're in, no matter where, you're, where you are in life, no matter how stressed you are or not stressed, rich or poor. We all have that opportunity. We have to build courage and learn from Jesus to be at noon by someone to offer them God's kingdom, to share God's kingdom. Words of encouragement, words of love, which of words of kindness, right? So um, we all have those opportunities, and that's an example he set for us. It didn't occur to me till I'm hearing the story again today, and I'm thinking, wow, how much we all can learn from that. So I'm going to try it, and I think all believers should try it in a, in a gentle way. We don't know what, what Jesus knew about that woman. We don't know what we, we need to know about others, but we simply can walk in peace in the name of Jesus in a, in a, in a, in a gentle way, not in a fanatical way. Right. You know, I know, I've known believers in my lifetime, they walk in with a hammer, forcing God on people, and it doesn't work that way. Jesus did not carry a hammer. Jesus allowed the hammer to put the nails in his hands. That's right. So uh, what an opportunity for us, an obligation as Christians to continue in that path that Jesus did. It's what's so interesting. When you study the Gospels, I've come to the lost sheep of the house, God's people, yes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, those what we call synoptic Gospels. But when you get into John, he shows it's for the world, people, gender, cultures, all of them, not just this one culture. And in Acts, you see it after that experience, the power that can happen when a life, when the mask mm -hmm. is removed. That's right. And 2,000 years later, we're living That's in right. a world, like in a world that is worldwide faith that began with these encounters mm. and Jesus just inviting people, yeah. just come follow me, just come lean in, drink of what I have to give you, right? Um, 2000, we're, we're like, we're a visual representation of how this can multiply, but Amen. it begins with making the space yeah. to speak and allow and invite someone else. Um, and I think we can still do that today. Oh, absolutely. I think the opportunity, especially at this time and age where social media exists and uh, uh, people have heard about Christ and people are, they don't, you know, put media aside. People are seeking God. People are looking up to heaven, looking for signs from God, looking for God to speak with them. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege to meet a lady at a, at, and I don't know if I can say the place name, but, uh, but at a place where they're doing the oil change on my wife's car. And uh, the woman was behind the counter was very friendly in her late 50s, friendly to everyone. And I'm thinking, 
what did this woman eat for breakfast? Mm -hmm. So when my chance came to the counter, I walked up to her and I said, you got to give me what you're eating. And she goes, excuse me? And start laughing and looking at her colleagues. I said, you are so friendly, so full of life. What, what, do you, what did you have for breakfast? And she laughed her head off and came up from around the counter. She said, can I give you a hug? And I said, yeah, sure. I was kind of taken back. But uh, she said, you know, it's the power of Jesus. Hmm. Wow. And I was like, wow. <laughs> wow, I should have walked in with that <laughs> smile. I should have walked in with that attitude. Mm. And everyone in that waiting room, I think there was about 20 people in the waiting room, people of all different race and nationalities and genders, a mixture of them. And they were absolutely loving this woman. Mm. She was not being a com comedian. She was, not being, she was not making mockery or being silly or talking nonsense, but she was just glowing, yeah. calling honey, baby, mm -hmm. sweetheart, you know, those who are sitting there, your car will be ready, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sorry it's taking so long. It was just attentive to others. Mm. And then when she told me what she said, it's like, praise you, Lord, here's the lesson for me for a guy who's been doing it for 27 years. That's not enough when I know. I need to go out with that mm -hmm. spirit, that attitude. So she witnessed to others. The minute she said what she said about her faith, everyone looked up at her and smiled. Mm -hmm. And some of them said, amen. So my point is, the world wants God, the world seeking God. Let's not be misled by media. Let's not be afraid to present God in the workplace, in our circles of life. Yeah, so vitally important. As a kid, I always looked at Jesus when I was younger as a softy, head to one side, <laughs> his hands like they'd just been washed in dove, and he could meet people of different cultures. Mm. Their mask would melt away, mm. be changed, and that's what happens when we have that personal encounter with Jesus Christ as our Savior. Thank God for mask removal. Yeah. You see people who they really are and what they're all about. That parochial control. No. Mm -hmm. Ladies, important. Mm. Men, important. God made us that creation. Mm. And God can use us in a very special way. Amen. And that's what's so intriguing. And, and your picture, I just love it. It's better than what I remembered as a kid <laughs> about Jesus. I see now mm -hmm. real person right. who loved people for real, mm -hmm. genuinely. Amen. 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 You, you know what I, I really enjoy as I grow more in the word of God, because I got to remind you, I was lost in the world. And everything, all the values was presented to me through my mom and my family growing up in an Adventist home. All went out the door, lived a life contrary of God's uh, commandments. And I so overdid it, I forgot his teachings. Mm. It really became foreign to me. But coming back to Christ is taking these baby steps. People recognize I'm a baby Christian in faith. Some figured either I don't know anything about the Word of God or I'm just working my way through. And people brought themselves down to my level mm. and they gave me just enough light, just enough information to chew on mm. and to digest. And, and maybe, I think it was the Holy Spirit, by the way. I don't think anyone had it so calculated that mm. I'm only going to tell Ganem this much. Right. But it was, as you said, Jesus was working in concert with the Holy Spirit, following the steps of the Holy Spirit. And here the Holy Spirit at work in my life, and I'm one of many millions who God continued pursuing in life mm -hmm. and continued pursuing in life. Uh, but it took those many, many steps to fill my cup slowly, not drowning me right. and overwhelming me, yeah. but enough for me to enjoy the flavor, to begin get hooked on it in a good way that I want to drink from that cup. So, so I, I, I bring that up again as Christians, what opportunities we have, as those did with me, we can do for others. Amen. Amen. Let's not hammer the gospel, but let's bring that love that Jesus showed to the Samaritan woman, the least in society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is just, it's so overwhelming for me 
for a man who, you see how the world is divided in classes. Mm -hmm. And yet Jesus broke all those barriers. Mm -hmm. And he went to the tax collectors. He went to the prostitute. He went to the woman by the, at the well. And the list goes on and on and on. Because he didn't create those classes. That's because what he created was the heart mm -hmm. and the that's human vessel where his, his spirit could reside. And yet that's the thing that we put layers upon and we put labels on and we put categories on, that's right? right? That's right. And then we begin to worship the labels and the categories and the thing that has the value, which is the heart, the human heart, right. the sacred vessel where the spirit can live, we bypass. Well, and that's where ideology comes in. Mm. The material becomes yeah. our God, our living, uh, uh, you know, when, when, when that becomes, when that becomes mm -hmm. what we, we unconsciously worship because that's what we adopt, right. then we're just going to become that. We're not going to become a heart right. made by Christ. We're not going to be part of his kingdom. That's right. Well, we have wonderful music. Let's do it. Yeah. Wonderful music coming up. Uh, Asia Bookle, and she's going to be singing, Who Am I? Ooh, Who am I? Beautiful.
Oh, Asia, amen. I love that song so much. Thank you. You have a wide range there, girl. Very impressive. I love it. Okay, LLBN family, what miracle has happened in your life lately that you are thinking, I need to give a thank offering to God for what just happened in my life? Think about that. I'm gonna share really quickly, as fast as I can, a story that has happened recently that I'm giving thanks for, and I just gave my donation to God and um, to LLBN. So every day I've been really trying to be more intentional of aligning my will with God and really letting him know that. Lord, delete, change, add, let my will for today align with yours. Okay, so I had lunch with a friend on Sunday and this is a friend that I've sung with for years, many years ago. And the last time we sang together was probably 20 years ago, praise music. And then she disappeared for like more than a decade. I would try to reach out to her, nothing. All other friends would reach out to her, nothing. And so about five years ago, us faculty of the nutrition dietetics, we had just finished lunch and BJ's and I stepped out and I see this friend that I haven't seen in years. And immediately I call out to her and I said, how are you? And she said, three weeks ago, I had a heart attack and I'm doing well. She was 40, just 49 at that time. But since then, it's been five years now, we've been seeing each other on a regular basis, getting together with other friends. But I was sad to know that over the five years, she has left the church. And her dad is a prominent teacher in the Adventist community and is, is very well respected. Okay, I didn't want to push anything. I was just happy to see her. I know she still loved God. Well, on Sunday, she said, Gigi, you know, I've been thinking that I want to go back to church. And I was shocked, but I was happy. But I didn't get overly happy yet. I wasn't sure where this was going. And she said, I was thinking about the Ten Commandments and how that one commandment says, remember the Sabbath. And she said, that one starts with remember. I think I want to start keeping the Sabbath again, but I don't know where to go. She has a coworker that she's worked with for years, but actually had lunch with for the first time last Friday. In their conversation, my friend said, wait a minute, are you Adventist? And her colleague said, well, yes, I am. And my friend said, I want to start going to church. And her friend said, well, come to La Sierra University. My son is going to get baptized in a couple Sabbaths. So come join that Sabbath and come eat at my house. And so she said, okay. But she watched online this past Sabbath to see what the sermon was going to be like. Well, the pastor of that church wasn't supposed to speak that Sabbath, the new pastor, but he did. And that was the first time she heard a sermon in a long time and she just started to cry. And she goes, who is this pastor? I said, I don't know, I've, I've heard he's new, but I don't know who he is. Okay, well, you know, that's the second miracle that he, he preached. So we, we talked for a little bit more and when we left the restaurant, well, we took a selfie. But after we took the selfie, she said, wait a minute, wasn't that the pastor who, who preaches at La Sierra or who's at La Sierra? I said, I don't know. I don't know how he looks like. So we started running after him. And I stopped him and I said, aren't you the pastor that, that is at La Sierra University? And he said, yes, I am. And we took that as a third sign from God that it is time for her to go back to church. What is that pastor doing at Victoria Garden? And we could have left earlier or later and we could have missed him, but she noticed him. God's working miracles every single day and let's show him our gratitude by the gifts that we give back to him. So I've given my gift of love to LLBN just a few minutes ago and think about a miracle in your life and give a thank offering to God by giving to LOBN. Hello, my name is Jonathan Young and I've had the privilege of being able to volunteer here at LLBN for their worship service. 
And I want to read a quick word from the Bible for you today. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 8. It says, the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. And I think as I've been here, I've been volunteering here, I think this applies to me especially, that I've been able to be blessed with getting to know people, with getting to hear the, the letters that you send in explaining your being blessed by, by our service here as well, our volunteering. And we want to, here at LLBN, encourage you to continue to support us, whether that is through, your watching, through watching our services, through our programs, or by financially supporting us as well. We have several things, several studios that still need to be filled out. And so we thank you for continuing to support us, continuing to choose to worship with us and to watch us. And we pray, it's our prayer that God continues to bless you. Well said. Well, we're on track and then we're all eager to hear your last part. Look up, the harvest is ready. Yes. Are you ready? The harvest is ready. I'm ready. All right. So uh, thank you folks for being with us. Uh, there's a little bit more to go in this program, so stay tuned. Doctor. Well, I love that story, Gigi. His name is Pastor Iki Taimi, just in case you want to know. Uh, he is phenomenal, and uh, we, love, we love Pastor Iki. Friends, if you've been with us, um, we are wrapping up the story of the Samaritan women, but really it's the story of Jesus. There's something that I, have, I say to youth and young adults all the time. When I was a kid, I used to think that this book was written for, uh, and it was filled with like superheroes and just incredible people. And then when I read it for myself, I realized that it's really the story of an incredible God, a massive, amazing, loving God. And what happens is every time that we choose to enter into an encounter with God. Remember, he comes first. So all we're doing is leaning into this conversation. All of a sudden, we're part of his story. I am sure that when we get to heaven, she's going to be incredibly surprised that for thousands of years, we told the story. She doesn't even have a name. I believe John does that purposely. Remember, Nicodemus has a name. She doesn't even have a name. But in heaven, we get to meet her, the Samaritan women. So if you have been with us, we just left a conversation between Jesus and her, whereby her masks are removed, and she just stays in this conversation with Jesus. And she enters into a deeper theological conversation with Jesus. They talk about everything. They talk about worship, because remember, she's, she's also now learning from this rabbi. She's realizing, I'm with someone really special. I mean, he knows all these things. I don't have time to go through through all these verses. I'm going to jump over to verse 25. So she's been engaged with Jesus on this conversation about worship. Jesus makes it clear that we're going to move into a moment where we're going to worship God in spirit and truth. And friends, we live in that moment. This is us. We live in a moment where we worship God, not in a location or in a place, but with our hearts and every day aligning it, like Gigi said. Every day giving God what we have and allowing him to align our, align our thinking, align our behaving, align our words, our listening, right? But I love this. I want you to notice that in verse 25, well, 24, he says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit because, you know, she's, she's saying we're going to know this Messiah. In verse 25, Jesus says to her, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. Sorry, she says to him, I know that Messiah Christ is coming. And when he comes, she says, he will explain everything. This tells you that she is somebody who is thirsty, who's been, who's been leaning into the scriptures. She knows, she wants, she awaits for a Messiah. And then verse 28, sorry, verse 26, then Jesus declares to her, I who speak, I am he. Friends, Jesus 
We started the story with him having to leave his own because they're battling as to who has what and baptized who. And we're going to end the story with Jesus revealing who he is to this woman, this nobody, this Samaritan that nobody knew, nobody, nobody could have imagined. He reveals himself to her. I can't tell you how many times I have prayed to him. I desire that. Allow my life and my, my, the way in which I understand to be a place where you can reveal your whole self to me. He doesn't reveal himself to many, but he reveals himself to her because her heart is ready to receive him. The story continues. Verse 27, the disciples return. And they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But I love this about John. John's going to go, go ahead and just let us know. He says, but no one asked. What do you want? Or why are you talking with her, right? John is like, okay, we're all surprised, but none of us is asking what he's doing or what he's, you know, what he's talking about, right? It's odd. What is Jesus doing? But then the next verse reveals that he didn't have to ask. That something about the posture of the disciples when they return, let her know you need to go. Because the next verse says, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people. Now let me pause for a second because this is what I mean. She has been sitting at the feet of a rabbi of a teacher, of the Son of God himself. And not once has she felt like she has to run or go. As a matter of fact, that whole time she has felt comfortable enough to be able to ask him questions, to engage him in dialogue about theology, about worship. The disciples come into the picture, and though they say nothing, somehow the minute they enter, she has to go. Friends, I have often said to God, please spare me. Do not allow me to be that human that somehow, when people are trying to enter into your presence because of the way that I looked at them, because of the, because of the way in which I judged not with words, but with my body demeanor, it said to them, what are you doing here? What do you want? Right? And we can do that. I've been in youth ministry all of my life, over 30 years, trying to care for youth and young adults. And I will tell you that I have stories after stories of youth and young adults who have entered a church community and haven't been allowed to enter through the front door because you're not dressed appropriately. Go home and change. We oftentimes misassume or we assume incorrectly that our work is to defend Christ, but rather... Friends, our work is to invite people into Christ. There's a difference in that. Jesus is the Son of God, and he is making space in himself so that she may know God. And as a follower of Jesus, I must daily make space in myself so that anyone that enters into my presence can find and see and know that the Son of God is alive and well today. But that requires that I recognize that my work is not to keep people from Jesus, but to invite people to Jesus. And we don't have to do that with words. We do that often just with our mere presence. The story ends because our time is ending, and I want to point something out. The disciples come back, and the disciples are worried about Jesus. He hasn't eaten food. They're wanting to feed his physical being. You need to, who's fed them? How does he have all this energy, right? They left him tired and weary. Oftentimes, we, his disciples, are worried about the wrong thing equally. Because Jesus says to him, I don't, my food, 
the food that I have been given, I've already been fed, friends. He says, they come out of town, the disciples urge him to eat. Verse 32, he says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. What is the food that Jesus has to eat? That he is actively engaged and co-laboring with his father for the salvation of many. And that is better than physical food. That is spiritual food. That is life-giving food. And then he says these words. Verse 35. Do you not say four months more and the harvest and then the harvest? But I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe at harvest. I want to leave you with this because I fully believe that the moment we are living in is a moment where the field and the harvest is ripe, where the Holy Spirit is moving around left and right, and he's looking for those of us who have eyes to see because he needs us to go and do the work that we've been called to do. Meantime, we're worried about who's eating and who's doing this and who's doing the other. And he says, just come and see. Come and be with my people. Come bring a word to my people. This story is going to end, and you could read it for yourself, with her returning. Her sharing what little she had, all she had. She had less than Moses. Moses had at least a staff. She has nothing but just her word. Come and see. Come and see this one who's told me everything that I am. But the story ends with verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed. He told me everything I ever did, she said. And then they urged him to stay for two days. He must leave because of a fight and battle and, and, and because of all the jealousy, but here these people make space for him and he stays in Samaria for two days. And like I said earlier, Acts will chronicle what happens with that seed that he planted. I leave you with this word. I found this um, old devotional from 1949. It was a gift that was given to a family. I found it at a library, one of those free auctions. It's from Ellen G. White. It's called With Dawn, With God at Dawn. And do you know, I want to read you what today's um, story had for us to, to say. This is what Ellen G. White says. Vast territories are opened before us where the light of truth has never penetrated. Whichever way we look, we see rich harvest ready, ready to be gathered. She goes on to say, there must be an awakening, a spiritual renovation. All these masks that we are saying to Jesus, we want to remove them with you. We want to be made new. We want to be transformed. There has to be a spiritual renovation. She goes on to say, there is a work for every individual who names the name of Christ. A voice from heaven is solemnly calling you, my friend. A great work of saving souls remains yet to be done. And listen to this. This work of great souls, of saving souls, every angel in glory is engaged in this work. Every angel in glory is... Whatever work God has called you to do, whatever little thing, whatever conversation, whatever posture of your heart that will remain open because you've intentionally allowed God, whatever that is, know that you've got a legion of angels who are next to you daily attempting to be part of this work with you. You're not alone. Do not grow weary. Do not make places where you keep people out, but become a follower of Jesus that invites people in. And may your posture, may the posture of your heart and of your mind be one that daily says to everyone you meet, come and meet my Jesus, for he has rescued me. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to, as uh, Dr. Bazan join us, I'm going to ask Gigi Novell to come and join us as well and ask her to watch her steps. I uh, Too many steps to watch. And, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll close here together. It's been a great program. Have a seat. Thank, Thank you. you, Gigi. Well, Thank you. Uh, that was a great conclusion, mm -hmm. Dr. Bazan. Uh, I'll leave the floor open here for discussion. Anyone would like to add or ask a question? Go ahead, Dr. Taylor. <laughs> no, just the, all four presentations. You just blended them together so beautifully yes. to show what is earthly, we think earthly. But Jesus came down from heaven to become one of us and related how we should live and relate how those masks can disappear to leadership and to women. God can utilize their talents and gifts. And the world is looking on. Samaritans, different cultures, how they can respond to the beauty of Jesus Christ. He transcends our cultures. He transcends all that we think we are to who he really is. That's why he says, I am the great I am. I am from the past. I am presently. I am for the future. I am whenever you need me. I'm there. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Amen. Well, why don't we take a music break and come back here with a final conclusion. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, we get to hear once again yes. from Asia right. Bukal. And she is going to sing Rescue. Isn't God wonderful? Yes. He comes and rescues us. Amen. Rescue Nicodemus. He rescued Nicodemus and he rescued, rescued the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. And he rescues rescued. us today. Oh, rescues yes. me. Right? Yes. He rescues me. Minute later. by minute. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, exactly. Amen. Amen. Every single one. Yes. Thank you, Asia. Hidden. It's never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. Though you were broken, your innocence stolen. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear. So as your S O S, and I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. There is no distance. Cannot be covered over and over. You're not defenseless. I'll be a shelter, I'll be your armor. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SO as your SO. And I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. And I
Well, this has been a wonderful program, uh, very uplifting, um, reconnecting us with the Word of God, and we pray and hope our viewers around the world benefited from this program and uh, was blessed by it as we have been here in this room. This room, this building would have never existed without your love and support that we did it in two years with no funds on hand, borrowed every couple of months, borrowed every couple of months. We never stopped the project. Money kept coming in until we completely finished the whole building. And then we had to pay back some of the loans. And as soon as we were almost ready to use the studio, all the loans were paid off. Mm. Glory to God. That's a testimony to a living God in heaven that he truly loves the people who give their hearts to or give his, their hearts to him. And he works with us and with you all the way through every venture, every journey that we put our trust in with him. Yeah. But now we have Gigi here. Oh, uh, she yeah. transitioned Hello. her store from there to here. <laughs> and yeah, we're excited to see you here. I'm not lonely anymore now over there. You, you are among friends. <laughs> yes, I am. Whether you're there or here. Well, thank you so much. Gannon, how many stations are there a total that LOBN is beaming out into the world? So we have eight channel broadcasting 24-7. Mm. Number nine, we've got all the content for seven months in advance. Yeah. We've got all the hardware, all the technologies put in place. As a matter of fact, it's all in place and the volunteers for the Romanian channel mm. being trained to upload content and to start schedule the channel to go on the air just as soon as they're ready. Mm -hmm. And the 10th channel is Ten? gonna be more video and demand channel because there isn't, it's Armenian channel. Okay. So we have the Romanian mm -hmm. that's going on the air soon and then the Armenian coming up as a VOD. As a matter of fact, it's on our website. People can go click and watch some of its programs as we speak. And of course they can do that with all 10 channels. Incredible. Glory to God. Because yes. I can tell you 27 years, mm -hmm. it was very foggy. Yeah. You, didn't, you don't know what's going to happen in six months. Mm -hmm. And we face the most difficult and hardest times, spiritually, physically, and financially. Mm -hmm. Just right when we started the ministry of LLVN. Wow. Mm -hmm. The world caved in on us. Mm -hmm. But within two years, as our faith got refined mm -hmm. and our trust went back more into Jesus rather than in our ability mm -hmm. to do so, things just start blossoming. Right. Incredible. So, Ganem, how much money are we needing by the end of this year? What are we shooting for? We need half a million dollar okay. before end of December. Okay. We need half a million dollars. It's a lot of money. A lot of but money. But in this type of business where you're broadcasting worldwide, that amount is unheard of. Most broadcast entities of our size operating at 20 to $24 million a year. We're doing it for about two point three million dollars a year wow. so there's a contrast that half million is significant but when you look at the overall what we're able to do mm -hmm. it's insignificant mm. incredible there are so many ways that all of us can give and there is um, planned giving is one of them right. trust wills is there anything else that I left out well, they can mm -hmm. give us state, state, real estate. Mm -hmm. We do receive properties. Oh, there you go. That we liquidate and collect cash. Excellent. Cash is what most need, but there's endowments and trust mm -hmm. that can help sustain us. It's our backup money for years to come. Got See, it. this ministry cannot go to sleep. It hasn't no. slept for 27 years. Mm -hmm. Its Incredible. eyes being open. Mm -hmm birthing more channels and more ministries. Right. And its eyes will remain, hopefully, until Jesus returns. Amen. Amen. And, you know, you can go to our website to find out all the details about all those different ways that we just mentioned. And so please go to our website at lbn.tv. And I have to quickly mention right here that my dad was in communication with all of you about a year ago right. because he was planning a trip to the Holy Land and that every person that went on the trip, a portion would be donated to LLBN. Correct. So guess what? Two days ago, my dad and his group left on Sunday. 
and they just finished their first day in Cairo. And so when they get back, then my dad will be able to give his gift of love to LLBN. So there are different ways to be able to raise funds for LLBN in your own way that is also enjoyable for you. Amen. Mm -hmm. well, I knew someone who used to buy and sell used cars and oh. give us the money for that. Lucky. So there are ways. And I knew mm -hmm. of a church that a couple of years ago, they pledged for one year to raise funds for us. And they gave us an access of, I think, 50 some thousand dollars collecting money from their local communities yeah. for LLBN. So there are all kinds of ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. And their prayers is the most the important yes. component. Because mm -hmm. there is so much power in prayer. It's incredible that God hears our every word that we utter, that we speak, that we think. And when we are praying for LLBN, it goes around the world so that this ministry can keep going on. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well said, Gigi. I thank you for bringing us such support here on this evening and all throughout the year to LLBN to bless our viewers out there who watch us daily and blessed by the word of God as we had tonight, as we heard from... Dr. Vazan and yes. Dr. Taylor and Sheila and Gigi and lots of volunteers in the background and staff members who are supporting this ministry to bless you and to honor God who is our living God. Dr. Vazan, let's give you the last word. We have 30 seconds for you to make a spiritual closure. Mm. Well, I, I loved Asia's song about rescue. I will find you. I will rescue you. I think if I want to leave you with the last word is, listen, if, if you haven't picked this up, pick it up. Mm. If you've picked it up, then start inviting the Holy Spirit to let you know what is it that you're calling me for? How can I serve you? Because he is on a rescue mission. And his rescue mm. mission is to save all mm. right i have come that all be saved we thank you and may he rescue you in turn i pray mm.